So I want to start by um, thanking Davidson and Company for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'm going to attempt to cover four related topics. So let's see, we're going to start with opportunities that you have as officers and directors and perhaps advisors as well in the room to proactively communicate with staff at the Securities Commission. And those, um, that type of communication might be about company specific issues or it might be about developments in terms of standard setting or policy initiatives. The second thing I'll talk about is um, staff reviews of uh, financial statements and other related filings. Then we'll talk about uh, correcting an error or deficiency in a filing. That could be one of the outcomes from that second category. And then we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about um, how the BC Securities Commission um, has recognized CPAB and the interactions that we have. So a few comments about my slides. Um, they reflect a lack of consensus about what people like you like when you come to these presentations. So, you know, the trend is just put like three words per slide, but when I tried that recently, I got feedback there wasn't enough detail. So I've got some slides with three or four words. I've got some slides with pictures. I've got some slides with a lot of words. I hope you all find a few slides that you like. <laughs> and if there are topics where um, if you need more detail uh, and it's on material I've covered, please contact me and I can get you more detail. So we're going to start with these opportunities for you to contact us. And the first area is pre-filings. So a pre-file is typically a consultation between a filer and staff about how securities legislation applies to a particular transaction or event. We have a couple national policies, one on prospectuses, one on exemption applications that define this um, a little bit more formally and, and talk about the processes for a formal pre-filing. But I want to also mention that um, issuers and their advisors can phone us or email us to get guidance in a particular situation. Because we understand that sometimes it's challenging to identify the features of our legislation and policies that are relevant to a particular transaction. So sometimes a phone call can help you just get started on the right path or figure out what to include in a more formal written application. Um, having said that, I want to emphasize that we staff are not your advisors. Um, so our role is um, not to help you sort through the facts or provide education on accounting standards. Um, but having said that, once you've, you've got um, an awareness of the facts and the relevant accounting issues, uh, please do feel free to contact us. So a common scenario where we would have a pre-filing discussion might be um, where an issuer and its advisor is trying to figure out whether securities legislation requires financial statements for a predecessor entity or a business that's been acquired. Another example might be challenges relating to the accounting uh, principles or the um, auditing standards that have been used for historical statements of those kind of entities. A second opportunity that you have to communicate with us is to let us know your views on proposed changes to our rules and policies. Um, we publish any changes for comment and we really do want to hear from stakeholders. We want to make sure that any changes that we have proposed fix a clearly defined problem and that the benefits to the change clearly outweigh the costs, including any unintended consequences. So for example, um, many of you would have attended the session in October um, where my colleague Mike Moretto spoke about some new provisions for venture issuers. And the process for developing those included um, asking for comments, getting those, and reviewing them. And that was really important to make sure that the final product is the right product. So also in this category of communication is the opportunity for you to share your views indirectly with us by um, sharing them with your advisors from Davidson. We have representatives from Davidson and Company participating in a group that we call the Public Company Forum. And that's a group 
um, sponsored by our provincial institute. And the, the goal of that group, it, we have reps from the various um, accounting firms who practice with, in the area of public company work. And, and also Andrew Creech and myself, we sit on that group. And we talk about a variety of issues um, relating to our rules, uh, as well as accounting um, standards and auditing standards. And so if your advisor from Davidson asks your views on something that's on our agenda, I'd really encourage you to, to provide your views because it's a great and very efficient way for your views to be known and seriously considered. Now, a third um, area that, oh, I guess I accidentally hit that, sorry, I'll have to be careful. Uh, a third area I wanna highlight for communication where you can um, reach out to us relates to the IFRS discussion group, and Grant mentioned this group. So there are two purposes for this group. One, to raise awareness in Canada of issues relating to the application of IFRS, um, and then when appropriate, to make recommendations to the Canadian board, um, who in turn will figure out whether to recommend that the international board or its interpretation committee consider an issue. So there's up to 20 people in this group um, with a wide range of backgrounds, and um, myself and the chief accountant from the Ontario Securities Commission are also in this group. So the slide here um, indicates the criteria for the kinds of things we're looking at. Does the issue arise in the application of the Standards of Canada? Is, it, is the issue widespread and is there um, divergent practice or the possibility of that? So if you encounter an issue that you think um, meets these criteria, please either contact myself or you can let your advisor at Davidson know and we will uh, take a look at it and, and get it on the agenda if appropriate. So a couple examples of things that we've talked about recently at the September meeting, uh, we discussed common examples of how to account for cloud computing arrangements. Um, at the December meeting, we talked about how to account for a reverse takeover involving a public company that's a shell and the acquisition of a 50% working interest in a group of assets. So I won't go into the details of the discussion, but those are available on the IDG website, um, which is indicated on the slide. And you can search that site by topic um, if you're encountering an issue and you don't, don't know where to turn, that's often a good place to check. So we're going to shift now to communication that staff typically uh, initiate with you, staff reviews. So um, the first time you'll know that this is going on in relation to a company that you're involved with is likely when you receive a letter like this. Uh, please note the very cordial opening. Our reviews are intended to help the company comply with securities regulation and improve the quality of disclosure that you are providing to shareholders and other investors. So each year, um, the jurisdictions within the Canadian Securities Administrators, we summarize the results from these continuous disclosure reviews that are done across the country. We do that on a March year round, so my next few slides are going to highlight the findings from the March 2015 year end, but I will say that the areas we're focusing on and the results we're seeing since that time are very similar. So in the year ended, um, March 2015, we did 280 of what we call full reviews. That's where we're looking at the filings that an issuer made for the past year, including their financial statements, MD&A, the certificates, uh, technical disclosure, the annual information forms, the business acquisition forms, and so forth, uh, and including uh, material change reports and also website material. We also did what we call um, issue-oriented reviews. We did 778 of those, and the topics for those um, included looking at certificates filed um, for the CEOs and CFOs, technical disclosure, um, the mining investor presentations, disclosure for issuers getting into the medical marijuana space, and some selected IFRS issues. And I will elaborate on the last one a little bit in a moment. This um, slide highlights the outcomes, and many of our reviews resulted in significant outcomes for issuers. In 8% of the cases, we made a referral to our enforcement department and or cease traded the issuer, put them on the default list. 
For 21% of our reviews, um, the issuer had to amend and refile one or more document. And then in 30% of the cases, the issuer agreed to make prospective changes. And this category includes um, making changes to comparative information in financial statements. So what were some of the recurring issues that we found and continue to find in financial statements? Well, um, several issuers failed to disclose information about the geographical areas um, that they're, they're operating in, and particularly revenues um, from external customers. Um, they, they failed to disclose information about major customers, particularly where the revenue from a significant customer is over the 10% level. A second recurring area is in the area of acquisition of a business, um, where we find sometimes there is a significant portion of the purchase price allocated to goodwill without separately identifying um, other intangible assets. And a third recurring area is the failure to disclose a description of the valuation techniques and the inputs um, used for fair value measurements. And I think this is um, particularly in BC an area that we continue to focus on and um, we know with the current economic client this is continuing to be an issue. Um, we continue to see room for improving in, in looking at those indicators of impairment um, and in measuring recoverable amount and then providing the disclosures that IFRS requires relating to this. So, um, you know, did you figure out recoverable amount using for valueless cost of disposal, or is it uh, value in use? Then where in the hierarchy are your inputs? Um, what kind of valuation techniques, key assumptions did you use? What were the significant judgments and uncertainties? We won't spend too much time on MDNA, but this slide summarizes some of the areas uh, we focused on last year. I will highlight the first one um, because we recently amended our notice that gives guidance on disclosures uh, for, that should accompany non-GAAP financial measures. And um, so, so our view is that disclosures are necessary to make sure these measures are not misleading. And we've had that notice for quite some time. We just updated it last week. Um, and the main reason we updated it is because there's been some recent changes to IS-1 within IFRS, and uh, so we, we no longer needed some of the guidance that we had that related to subtotals presented in Statement of Financial Position or Statement of Operations. However, we've retained the parallel guidance in relation to the Statement of Cash Flows, and that's really basic stuff like um, you know, make sure the, the measure is consistent from period to period. Make sure that you can figure out how it's, what it's comprised of. Um, don't make that measure more prominent than the uh, comparable or most comparable IFRS measures, um, those kind of, of issues. We've also slightly de uh, defi uh, changed the definition of the non-GAAP measure, but I think in substance it's, it's pretty much the same as what we had before. And so maybe I should have started this, but we're talking about a numerical measure of historical or future perf financial performance, financial position or cash flow that is not specified, defined, or determined under the issuer's gap, and it's not presented in the financial statements. So typically we're seeing these measures in MDNA or on the website or in a press release. We also have some new guidance um, on non-financial performance measures. It's very brief, but that's a new element of the notice that I would draw your attention to. So in terms of um, other documents that we looked at and some of the other issues we found, um, we found instances where issuers failed to file material contracts. We also continue to encounter situations where it, uh, information in other documents suggest that there was a material change, but the issuer failed to file the material change report um, within the 10-day period required. So one outcome, as I highlighted in that bar chart, um, from a staff review is the identification of an error or significant omission. 
Um, other circumstances other than a staff review may result in an issuer and or their auditor identifying an error or omission. So the first thing I want to talk about is the two uh, approaches for addressing this kind of situation. One is to amend and refile the document. And when you do that, there's a separate category on CEDAR, our filing system, um, for doing that. The other approach in the case particularly of financial statements is to restate the information when it's, prepared, when it's presented as comparatives to the next filing. So um, if an issuer determines that it's going to do one of these two things, amend and refile or uh, restate comparative information, the first question is whether that new information differs materially from the information originally filed. Now, where the um, refiling or restatement is the outcome of a staff review, we would, in almost all cases, take the position that the information is materially different from what was originally filed. I mean, we, we're going to focus on material issues in our reviews and, and pursue material issues. Um, our, our national policy on disclosure standards, uh, it's 51201, talks about making uh, judgments in terms of materiality and it talks about various factors including the nature of the information, volatility of the company's securities and market conditions, and the size and nature of the entity's operations. Other relevant guidance on this topic of materiality that we consider includes the material in the conceptual framework that the International Board has put out that relates to IFRS. There's also guidance within specific IFRSs um, IS 134 and 8, and also there's guidance on materiality in auditing standards. Now, occasionally an issuer or auditor may identify a matter that triggers a restatement or, or a, rest, um, uh, a particular restatement of comparatives where the materiality threshold is not met. Um, but if, if it is met, then in both cases, whether you're doing the approach of amend and refile or restating comparatives, in both those cases, the issuer has to file a news release um, under Section 11.5 of National Instrument 51102. And it has to do that news release immediately upon making the decision. So that point in time is almost always earlier than when the um, new document is available. So now that we've kind of dealt with that, um, oh, and I should say that news release is going to talk about the substance of the change and, and you know, just give it a description. So um, once you've figured that out, then the, um, th the next issue is which of those two methods, right? Um, so there are a number of fact, well, two main factors that I want to talk about in, in figuring out are you going to amend and refile? or in the case of financials, are you going to redo the comparatives? And the key one is pervasiveness of the error. So um, this gets at, is the error confined to a specific element, account, or, or um, items in the financial statements? Uh, does it relate to a substantive portion of the financial statements? And if it relates to disclosures, is, is, that, is the nature of this thing fundamental to a user's understanding of the financial statements? The second factor that can be relevant um, in determining which approach should apply is the timing of the next filing. However, this is usually not a filing where the misstatement is in interim financial statements. It may or may not be relevant where it's in annual financial statements. Um, I, if you're in this situation, to figure out which of the two methods to use, you should be talking to your audit committee, your auditor, uh, possibly legal counsel, and talk to staff. Um, in the case of a financial statement error, you're going to have to consider the impact on the audit report, MDNA, and certificates. So, for example, in MDNA, you'd have to update the summary data that's presented there. 
Um, in the case of a non-infant tracheary, you'll have to consider whether the nature of the error indicates that there is a problem with the controls and the impact on the conclusions around effectiveness. And that would affect both the certificates and the MDNA. Um, just a reminder that if you're doing the refiling, you'll have to, uh, of the financial statements, you'd also be filing amended MDNA and certificates. And then if it really, if it's a, um, if it relates to annual statements, you'd have to consider um, an amended, or the auditor's report on amended financial statements would have an emphasis of matter paragraph or other matter paragraph that refers to the note that, that gives all the details. And then one final reminder that um, you have to provide an opening statement of financial position if you restate items in the financial statements and also consistent with um, IS-8 that if that error goes back prior periods that the, the opening balances uh, would have to be restated. So after talking about restatements and refilings, I thought a little bit about the presentation that my colleague Mike Moreto gave in October, which many of you would have attended, um, and he was highlighting some of the new provisions for venture issuers, and one of those is a streamlined approach to um, MDNA for Q1, 2, and 3, the, what we call quarterly highlights. And I want to echo Mike's comments that we're encouraging issuers to use this new form. Um, and in our reviews of these, um, we're going to focus on um, whether an issuer made a reasonable attempt to hit the six key areas. Those are listed on the slide. Uh, we are, are going to focus on maybe providing comments about future filings. Um, we don't anticipate uh, requ requiring a refiling. So just by way of encouragement, um, don't let my comments about refilings discourage you, please. So how am I doing for time in Grant? Um, five minutes. Five minutes, perfect, <laughs> perfect. I hadn't timed this, so, so we're in about the right spot. So for our last topic, um, I'm gonna chat a little bit about the relationship between the BC Securities Commission and CPAP. So um, the auditors in the room will know uh, the, the main instrument we have, National Instrument 52108, is the rule that effectively establishes CPAP's role in relation to securities legislation. And this slide uh, kind of gives an overview of the key requirements. Basically, issuers have to have their audit reports prepared by a firm that has entered into what's called a participation <coughs> agreement with CPAP. And the firm cannot uh, be in receipt of a notice of non-compliance with um, any remedial actions that CPAP has imposed. And then the, the rule also requires an audit firm to tell us about uh, specified remedial actions that CPAP may have imposed. And the, the rule finally um, requires firms to notify the regulators and audit committees if the firm fails to address a defect in the audit firm system of quality control to CPAP satisfaction. And that, of course, is very rare. So, so that's uh, just by way of background, um, because probably of most relevance to people in this room is sort of understanding who does what in relation to um, accounting issues. And I think that there's sometimes been some questions around that. So in addition to National Submit 52108, the BC Securities Commission recognizes CPAB through a document we call a recognition order. Um, the order, you can see it, it's on our website. The current one was issued in August of 2014. And today I'm just going to cover one key feature of that document. And it's just a two-page document. So there's five conditions that talk about um, information that CPAB has to notify us about. So the first circumstance is where CPAB becomes aware of any violation by a firm of professional standards or its own rules relating to the audit of a reporting issuer that in CPAB's opinion creates a heightened risk to the investing public. 
So a um, lot of terms there, we can't explore them all, but generally, you know, if CPAP encounters clear and egregious non-compliance with Canadian gas, they're going to impose a remedial action. The challenge is that that process takes time. It can take um, weeks or even months for CPAP to complete their inspection, review the findings, and impose the actions. And so this term of the order is designed to ensure that uh, the BC Securities Commission gets notified about a situation in a timely basis so that we can respond and make sure that we're protecting investors. The second circumstance where CPAP has to initiate communication with us is to advise us if they have, uh, sorry, to tell us if they've advised a reporting issuer that the issuer should get staff's views about something. So this might apply where Steve, uh, CPAP staff encounter a situation that raises doubt about compliance with accounting standards or compliance with our rules. Um, maybe relating to issuing securities or other non-compliance, and it's clearly material. And CPAP may not be in a position to conclude at the time the matter has come to their attention, but they um, view it as, as a high-risk situation, and they've told the issuer to talk to us. So in that case, CPAP will notify us. The third um, part of this is CPAP tells us if they become aware that an issuer will be refiling financial statements or restating comparatives. And so, um, you know, CPAP might be reviewing an auditor's work for a particular audit. Uh, they conclude the auditor didn't do enough work in a particular area. Further work is done. As a result, the issuer and the auditor conclude that, yes, in fact, there should have been an impairment write down or some other amendment, and, um, and then in that case, CPAP will be notifying us. Now, our response to getting that kind of notification is generally going to be we're going to contact the issuer. We will discuss the situation relating to the processes, so the things we just talked about a few minutes ago, and we will, uh, of course, be reminding the issuer to get that, that press release out um, under 11.5 under of, of 51.102 that I highlighted. The, um, the next part of this is that CPAP uh, tells us if they have terminated the status of a firm. And then the final clause here is that CPAP tells us if they've received information that um, suggests that an issuer may have materially misstated its financial statements or breached securities legislation. So there's obviously overlap between that last one and the first one on this slide. Um, this one would include things like apparent non-compliance with accounting standards um, and other requirements in securities legislation. Um, so an example of this might be they might find an auditor's report uh, where the auditor is not in compliance under the 52108 requirements. So I hope that gives you uh, a better understanding of the relationship between the two organizations and it might prompt some questions which I'm sure Hans and I will be happy to try to address, but I'm going to close it off there because I'm pretty sure I've used up those five minutes. So thank you very much. <laughs>